Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to tell you seven things that I wish I knew before applying to law school. So first I'm just going to go over a list of the things that I'm going to cover and I'll put timestamps in the description in case you want to skip around. So we have the application timeline, the LSAT, your personal and diversity statement, the expense, how many schools you should apply to, letters of recommendation, and how to actually, literally, apply to law school. So those are the seven things that I'm going to be talking about. I'll just go ahead and get right on into it. So first things first, something everyone who's applying to law school should know is the application timeline. So most law school applications open on September 1st. A few schools open a little bit before or after, but by and large, law school applications open on September 1st. And then they close in mid early spring. So like February, March-ish is when most deadlines close. Once applications open, you can start hearing back about decisions or interviews pretty much as soon as you apply because law school admissions are rolling. For that reason, it is to your benefit to apply as early as possible and that's just because spots will fill up, scholarships will be taken away, so it's to your benefit to put your name in the pot as early as possible. Just because law school admissions are rolling doesn't mean that you're going to hear back in the order that you applied. Some schools kind of do that, but most schools don't. Most schools will read your application if they have a decision they'll let you know but a lot of schools won't have a decision the first time they read your application they'll want to compare you to other people other applicants so if you and someone else apply on September 2nd they might hear back on November 1st and you might not hear back until January and that's just how the cookie crumbles so yeah that's something to keep in mind when you're applying just because you apply early doesn't mean you'll hear back early but it's still beneficial to apply Early. I didn't apply until November and I was still fine. That's pretty early in the cycle. I think generally if you apply before Thanksgiving, that's a good timeline to have a set for yourself. But enough about that. Now we're going to talk about the LSAT. First things first, everyone has a different strategy. Everyone needs a different time commitment when it comes to studying for the LSAT and taking the LSAT. And I think that is the best advice I can give you. Nobody knows how you study and how you learn better than you do. So you'll hear people say, oh, you should use this tutor. You should try this book. And those things might be helpful for you but you have to decide at the end of the day what your most efficient strategy is going to be because there's so many different ways to study for the LSAT and you kind of just have to figure out what is going to work best for you. You need to know if you work better with a tutor or if you're more independent, if you like to read, if you like to watch videos, things like that. So yeah, don't let people pressure you into going a certain way when it comes to studying for the LSAT. You just have to know yourself on that one. That being said, I would say take a diagnostic at least six months before you want to take the test. That way you know like how much work you'll have to put in to get to your goal score. Some people study for like two years. I don't think that's necessary for anybody, but you know, there are intense people everywhere. So I don't think anyone needs that much time. I studied for two months, but that's also because it was early pandemic. So like there was literally nothing to do but sit in my house. So that's what I did for two months. Number three, your personal diversity and other statements. First of all, you need to allow yourself plenty of time to brainstorm, to draft, and to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. I've said this before on my personal statement video. Do not think your first draft is going to be your best draft. That does not work for anybody. That's not how writing works period you need to allow yourself plenty of time to read what you wrote and rethink what you wrote and just just let let your words marinate because they will get better with time even though like your gpa and your lsat scores are very important don't push your writing to the wayside because of that because if you have the same score and gpa as someone else which you probably will because there's just not that many numbers they're gonna look at your writing to determine who's the better candidate your writing is really what's gonna set you apart i would say allow at least a month to really focus on your personal and diversity statements and any other statement you have to write for law school and that includes time when you need to ask people to like read and critique your writing a week is not going to cut it two weeks is probably not going to cut it you just need time i took my lsat in june and then i spent the rest of my summer until september 1st writing and rewriting my statements and i think that was a very good plan i would recommend that plan to anyone really yeah also ask multiple people to read your statements ask multiple people to critique your statements but also remember that like 
nobody is the know-all be-all on how emissions work so take everything that anyone tells you with a grain of salt including me everyone has their own biases everyone has their own persuasions and that's going to affect like the advice that they give you at the end of the day like you're going to be a lawyer you need to know how to depend on your own judgment your personal statements are a great place to start practicing that so if someone tells you something or gives you some advice and you really just you're not rocking with it you don't have to change something just because someone said to change it even if you think that person is is like higher up than you you at the end of the day have to be happy with what you submit to law schools it has to reflect you make sure that whatever you write whatever risks you are taking you are comfortable taking those risks you are comfortable saying whatever you're saying next whatever you write think of it as a persuasive essay at the end of the day you're trying to convince someone that they need you at their law school and that thought should like always be in your head when you're writing your statement even when you are telling an anecdote or talking about your values or whatever you're going to talk about every sentence should be persuasive in some way it should all point back to why you deserve to go to this law school and why this law school wants you there my last tip for the for the personal statements diversity statements is that your statement should be so unique that nobody else could have written it a lot of people have a lot of experiences that were life-changing for them like going on a mission trip or seeing someone close to them in a hard situation or something like that but if a lot of people have had that experience then it's not unique to you you need to dig deeper so that you can tell a story and you can write a paper that literally nobody else can write that is what's going to make you stand out because these admissions counselors are reading literally thousands of papers you don't want to get lost in all of the other applicants you want to stand out and the only way to do that is to make sure that you are telling your unique story okay number four everyone's favorite let's talk about the money so applying to law school is a very 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 expensive process i don't think i realized that before i started applying luckily i had my parents to help me but if you are just relying on yourself to pay for school application expenses, then you need to be prepared financially because it's very expensive. So I'm just going to break it down for you. So these are the things that you absolutely have to pay for. There's no way around it. You have to pay $195 to register for CAS, which is like the law school common app type thing. And they basically like put your application together and send it to law schools. You have to take the LSAT. Well, for most schools, you still have to take the LSAT, which costs $200. That's only if you take a one. If you take more than once, you have to pay that fee again to send your application to any school you have to pay an additional 45 dollars fee to lsat slash cas and then each individual school has their own application fee that you also have to pay and those fees usually range from 70 to like 90 dollars so that's at least 565 dollars just to apply to one single law school i did not even include lsat rep cost so if you are paying $200 for books if you're paying thousands of dollars for a tutor those things are going to add up very quickly it's very easy very easy to spend at least a thousand dollars on law school applications LSAC does provide fee waivers but from my own experience they are very stingy when it comes to giving them out I have always like had fee waivers whenever those are an option it's never been an issue for me in college and even high school growing up whatever so I thought I would easily get one from LSAC initially they denied my application and I had to appeal before I got one but by then I had already applied to most of my schools so yeah I'm just saying that because I don't want anyone to rely on the fact that they're gonna get a fee waiver because I was definitely expecting to get one and then I didn't get one so yeah but if you do get one that covers honestly almost all of the costs so it makes a very big difference definitely apply if you think you might be eligible that will help significantly number five let's talk about how many schools should we apply to honestly this depends it depends on mostly two factors two two factors first it depends on what kind of school you want to go to so like how prestigious is the school that you want to go to and it also depends on your academic record so first and foremost if you want to go to a t14 if you want to go to an ivy you have to apply to a lot of schools and that's just because applying to those schools is honestly like a bit of a lottery you have a 179 4.0 and you can still get rejected from harvard from yale easily because they just look at your application very holistically which honestly is good because it allows for a more diverse class 
class, but it just means no one is guaranteed a spot anywhere. Me, for example, if you watched my acceptances, rejections video, all that, whatever, I got into some very highly ranked schools like U Chicago, NYU, and then I got waitlisted at lower ranked schools like the University of Texas. It at least feels very random. So if you want to go to one of those top schools, you really need to maximize your choices by applying to as many schools as you can and that you can see yourself going to. I didn't apply to the entire top 14 because I knew I didn't want to like move to Virginia for example so I didn't apply to University of Virginia. Any school that I could see myself at I applied to because I knew I wanted to go to a top school. If you want to go to a more mid-tier ranked school like your state school or something like that then you definitely can apply to less schools especially if your LSAT score and your GPA are higher than their median scores because then you have a higher chance of getting in and those schools generally like having applicants who are going to bring up their average GPA, their average LSAT score. So if you're above them, you have a pretty good chance of getting in, whereas that's not always the case with T14 or Ivy League schools. That being said, I still would apply to a safety school, whatever safety is for you, and I would apply to a REACH school just to just, you know, throw your hat in the ring because you really, you never know. People like to act like it's an exact science, but it's not. It's random. It's a lottery. You really just have to shoot your shot because you don't know what's going to happen. And for that reason, like, have an open mind when you're applying to schools, especially if you're applying to many. If at all possible, I recommend not having a dream school because you don't know what's going to happen and you don't want to get disappointed. You don't get into your dream school, but you still get into, like, a very good school. But because it wasn't your dream, you end up disappointed. So I knew I was applying to a lot of very, very Hello, my camera just died, so we're on my phone now. It's kind of wonky, but uh, we're almost done, so we're just going to push through. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, I was talking about dream schools. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So I was saying I know I was applying to a lot of very good schools, a lot of schools that, like, I could easily not get into. So I did not want to have a dream school because I did not want to be the cause of my own heartbreak. So once I started getting into schools, that's when I allowed myself to fantasize a little bit more and be like, oh my gosh, I would love to move here and live here. That'd be so fun, blah, blah, blah. I really try not to do that before. And it's annoying because people are gonna ask you, oh, well, where do you wanna go? What's your dream school, blase, blase. And it's like, oh, you know, I'll be happy if I get into any school on this list to be honest because I didn't want like my dream school to be NYU and then I'm mad because I'm going to U Chicago that just doesn't make any sense you know so that's just my prerogative I think I use that word correctly on that and I think that's all I have to say about how many schools you should apply to so yes next we're gonna move into your letters of recommendation your letters of recommendation to me are the most annoying part of the application because it's the only thing that's like really outside of your control and I also hate asking people for things yeah somebody go ahead and personality type me of course you want to ask people who like you this was always just like annoying to me because I am pretty introverted in class for sure. I was never the type of student who like wanted to stay and chit chat after class. I'm not going to office hours just for fun. If I know the material, I'm not coming. And if I don't, I'm probably not coming either because that's embarrassing. I wasn't about to ask to go to coffee with my professors. Literally, it's just not my personality. So I had to be very strategic when I was thinking about my letter recommendation because when you live your life like that, people don't know you that well. But luckily for me, I, I went on a May master after my sophomore year. I literally spent like three weeks straight with a professor and the environment of that, even though it wasn't like as long as a semester, it allows you to get to know your professor a lot faster, a lot easier and in a much more casual setting. I knew that me and that professor were cool. That's why I asked him to write one of my letters. The other professor, he was my advisor for my senior thesis, so I knew we were cool too. Um, and he also could like speak the most highly of me. So I asked him and then I asked one of my bosses for an internship I did again after my sophomore year. Honestly, like if you're an undergrad right now, start thinking now about who you want to write your letters of recommendation. It doesn't have to be someone from your junior year. If it is someone from your freshman or sophomore year, you want to keep in touch with that person so it's not awkward when you do ask for a letter of recommendation. And it doesn't have to be a serious keep in touch. It doesn't have to be like, can we go get coffee? Because I would literally hate that. Um, so what I did is once I knew who I wanted to be my recommendation writers, I would like send them a Christmas card. That's literally all I did I think and 
it just showed that I cared more than the average student and they would usually send one back handwritten super cute and it costs like five dollars so like it's nothing serious but it keeps you on their mind it also just leaves a pleasant taste in their mouth that sounds kind of weird but we're gonna roll with it and that way when I did have to ask them for recommendation letters they were like oh of course yes that being said so earlier I said that I didn't apply until November November 2nd is when my applications went complete that was actually a little bit annoying for me because I like I said I did everything over the summer I was ready on September 1st I was ready my applications were in by September 3rd but one of my recommenders did not submit my letter until November 2nd so my applications did not officially go complete until November 2nd and most schools will not look at your application until it's all the way complete so that really set me back two months and obviously it ended up being fine but in my head I was like you cannot be serious but really that's because I did not ask him to write it I did not I didn't ask any of my recommenders to write it until like the end of July I thought giving them a month would be a good amount of time but the reality is you don't know anybody else's schedule you don't know what anybody else has to do so you want to give people as much time as possible so when I um, reached out to one of my professors the one who took a long time he was like oh, okay yeah we can have a meeting um, but I'm not gonna be available till like mid-august so that already pushed me back two weeks two weeks into that month that I thought I was giving him and then when we met in August he was like okay sure when do you need it and I was like oh well I'm turning in my application September 1st but you can turn in your letter after I turn in my application so I didn't give him like a hard deadline which also elongated the process but you know what lessons learned if I were to do it again I would ask all of my recommenders as soon as my junior year ended or as soon as like the summer after junior year began that way they can have the whole entire summer to write your letter if need be and it can be ready on September 1st along with the rest of your applications. Don't freak out if you can't turn in everything on September 1st. Obviously most people don't do that and I didn't and I was fine but like I've said earlier the earlier you apply the better and if you can get those letter recommendations out of the way it's just going to be a lot less stress and something less for you to think about when you're applying. So yeah, the last thing we're gonna talk about is how to actually literally apply to law school. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to lsac.org, you're gonna make an account, you're gonna pay that fee that I talked about earlier, and then you are going to fill in your demographic information, and then you're going to select your communication preferences. When you do your demographic information, and when you select your communication preferences, that is pretty much what is going to drive like what law schools are reaching out to you and what they're saying. It can be a little bit annoying, it can clutter your inbox a bit, but law schools are gonna start emailing you, they're gonna be like, you should apply to our school, here's some promotional material, here's a picture of our campus, look at our numbers, all this stuff that you probably don't care about, but it will give you an idea of schools that you can apply to that you might not have thought of before. I do think it's worth it at the end of the day to get a lot of those annoying emails. And part of the reason that it's especially worth it is because some schools will reach out to you and they'll give you a fee waiver without you even applying. That happened to me with Duke, that happened to me with Michigan. And I literally was not gonna apply to Michigan because I was like, why would I move all the way up there? to the cold. I'm still moving to the cold, but it's not like in the middle of nowhere, like Michigan. But that's how I got my priority track invitation from Duke. They were like, basically like you're a strong candidate and if you apply to our school, we'll give you an answer within 10 days. So those kinds of things happen when you opt into receiving communications from law schools. So I would recommend doing that. After you fill out all that information, you can add law schools to your list. They all have some like fast facts on there about the school, where they're located, their size, things like that. Probably you're gonna already know that if you're putting the law school on your list. When applications open on September 1st, you fill out more demographic information for each of the law schools and then you submit your personal statement your diversity statement things like that every law school does not have diversity statement or like extra statements but I think most of them do and some of them have even more like why this school why this school essays that you can write if you are very interested in a school I would definitely look up to see if they have a like why Duke or why Columbia essay that way you can write that if that's your number one school I did not write any YX 
essays because I was like, I don't care about any of these schools that much and I already have a diversity statement. They don't need to read another thing from me. Obviously, again, I was fine without writing those. But I also, in my personal statements, at the end of each of my statement, I wrote a school specific blurb that talks about what I was interested in for that school. So I did not have a generic personal statement that I sent everywhere. Each personal statement was a little bit different at the end. If that works for me, I would recommend. I don't know. I honestly don't know if that's a normal thing or if people write the same statement anywhere. Some people will write the same statement and then literally just have like a a sentence where they like replace the school each time they literally just replace the school name mine was definitely more in depth than that like it was like a paragraph that was school specific which is why I didn't feel the need to write any additional YX essays <sighs> okay last thing because I'm getting tired Ooh you're gonna need to upload your transcripts to the LSAC website they will like do a grade report on your whole academic career they will put your percentile ranking in your school which I didn't know that until I saw it on the website I was like oh how do you guys know that it's kind of crazy yeah so make sure you don't have any holds like financial holds or anything on your account because that will block you from getting a transcript and that would be an annoying reason to not be able to submit your applications so yeah um this is a very long process a very expensive process a lot of work a lot of work goes into this at the end of the day give yourself a pat on the back because you did it and you're gonna do it and if you want to do it you can do it don't don't let little things stop you from living your dream yeah hopefully i answered a lot of questions but i'm sure i didn't answer all of them so if you have any questions please feel free to leave a comment below and i will respond probably quickly because i'm not doing anything until i go to law school haha <laughs> yeah make sure to like this video subscribe and i will see you guys next time